Good morning. I'm Jimmy Asbel, one of the pastors at Vineville United Methodist Church in Macon, Georgia. I want to thank you for tuning in to this broadcast. What you will see this morning is a rebroadcast of last Sunday's service. We're glad that you've tuned in and hope that you find this a meaningful worship experience. Good morning and welcome to worship here at Vineville on this Sunday morning. It's good to have you all joining us. I want to make sure that you're aware of just a few big things that are coming up in the life of the church over the next few weeks. The first of which is that next Sunday, November 1st, is All Saints Sunday. Uh, this will be our time to remember and celebrate the lives of those here in our church community that have died the past year. We'd love to have you join us at our 9 o'clock service in the CLC as we celebrate communion and remember those lives. Uh, but if you're not able to join us and still want to partake in communion, we've got some self-contained communion elements down in the CLC lobby that you can just come by and pick up sometime throughout the week so that you can celebrate in that sacrament with us. Also, starting next Sunday on November 1st, we will begin back with all of our children and youth ministry programming. So during our 9 o'clock service uh, in the CLC, we'll start back with our nursery, our preschool, and then his kids. If you'd like to come and bring your children to that, we just need you to go online and register them ahead of time so we know how many children and volunteers we need. Um, and then on that Sunday night at 6 o'clock in the CLC, the youth group will be gathering back together again as well. So I know we're all eager for those two ministries to get back in the groove and moving again. So I hope that you will bring your kids or drop off your youth. Our altar flowers this morning are given in loving memory of Mary and Julian Mercer and Dr. and Mrs. George Schusler by Carl and Lynn Schusler. So we're grateful to the Altar Guild for arranging them for us. We now turn our hearts and our minds to God's presence with us as we worship together. Good morning. It's good to worship with you again. As we sing about God's grace and his mercy, a thousand times I've failed, but still your mercy remains. A thousand times I've failed, your mercy remains. And should I stumble again, I'm caught in your grace, everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all faith. My heart and my soul, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out.
Consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just begun. And failure won't define me, that's what my father does. No, failure won't define me. Cause that's what my father does not the end game the journey is where you are you never want it perfect you just want it my heart and the story isn't over if the story isn't good and failure's never final when the father's in the room yeah failure's never final when the father's in the room come home the helpless find hope love is on the move when the father's in the room prison doors fling wide the dead come to life love is on the move when the father's in the room the miracles take place the cynical find Father's in the room. 
Jericho walls are quaking, strongholds now are shaking. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. And love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Ooh, lay your burdens down. Ooh, here in the Father's house, check your shame. Would you join us now as we affirm our faith and the children lead us in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. And we are all in spirit. The, the, the Holy Catholic, Catholic Church. The communion of saints. The forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. God of all ages, of all nations, of everything that has breath, we have gathered this morning from all across our city to worship you. We come from many places with varied lives and circumstances, but we are gathered as one, united by the love of your Son. God, long ago when the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, you created light and called it good. And when you separated the waters above from the waters below, you called it good. And when you created the sun and moon, all the stars and the heavens, creatures to crawl and swim and fly upon the earth, you declared that it was good. Everything that your hands have made, you declared good. As we live and move upon this earth that you have created, may we have the same awareness of its goodness. May our hearts be stirred to care for your creation, to be joyful at its beauty, and to mourn when things go awry. As wildfires out west burn their way through forests and towns, we lift up prayers for those and their path, for those still recovering from flooding or damage done by hurricanes. We lift up those who have stayed behind long after the media has shifted its focus. 
Lord, our hearts break when we witness the cruel ways that your children sometimes treat one another. We have seen the mistrust, the fear and hate that exist in our world. And oftentimes we don't know what to do. We don't know what to say or how to make things right. We feel helpless. But clearly something is not right, Lord. And we need your spirit of peace. We need your spirit of mercy and compassion to descend upon us and lead us. Show us your way, God. As we look around the world and to the people that you have created, our hearts grieve for the violence in places like Kabul, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. We grieve for all other towns and countries where violence is all too common. We pray that you would protect and comfort those whose lives get caught in the crossfire of hate. We pray for the cities that never make the news cycle, for the people and places that we never will know about. We ask your forgiveness as we leave our brothers and sisters in despair and oppression. Forgive us when we lose sight of Jesus' way. Within our own country, we pray for our leaders, both present and in the future. We pray that they will govern with justice and wisdom and integrity. And in the amidst a season of name-calling and division, that we may be a light to others, that we can represent a different way, a way of respect and love of neighbor. As we go throughout our week, help us to remember your constant presence with your people, your guiding light and your merciful love, We give you thanks for all that you are and all that we can be in you. Let everything that has breath praise you today and every day as we remember the words of your Son saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the world is tossing me like a ship upon the sea, thou who rulest wind and water, stand by me. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. When the hosts of hell assail and my strength begins to fail, thou who never lost a battle, stand by me. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. When I've done the best I can, and my friends misunderstand, thou who knowest all about me, stand by me. When I'm growing old, Stand by me when I'm growing old and feeble. Stand. 
stand by me when my life becomes a burden and i'm nearing chilly jordan O thou lily of the valley stand by me i invite the children to come and join us around front of the television or the computer or whatever you're gathered around this morning, around the telephone to see. This morning, I want to talk a little bit. I brought two things with me. Um, you, you've seen these a lot, I'm sure. Uh, some of you use these at school. Um, one of them is a pen. This is one of our Bible pens that you can write with. It's nice. And, and then this other is a pencil. Um, and I've used this one a lot, um, you can see. And, um, and the pencil... Uh, it has an eraser on it. The thing about writing with pen, and I like writing with a pen, but you got to make sure you get it right when you write with pen. Because um, if you get it wrong, you have to make out a big scribble on your page to cover it up. Um, but if you, if you write with a pencil and then you, wanna, you make a mistake, uh, you can erase it and, and start over. Which is pretty good because um, when I'm writing, I make a lot of mistakes. And so it's good to have a, a, a pencil uh, with a good eraser on it. Well, as I was thinking about our, our scripture lesson and our, the sermon for today, I, I was reminded of the eraser on a pencil that, that God has given us some, a great opportunity uh, to fix our mistakes. Like a pencil uh, eraser on a piece of paper that that God has made a way that we can erase all of our sin, um, that we can erase our guilt, that even, even when we've done things that we shouldn't do, that we can ask God forgiveness. And, and like a giant eraser, God, God can erase that uh, and, and fix it. Uh, and and that then we have a chance to, to make a new start, to, to reboot, uh, to get a, a do-over and fix uh, our answer to, to write it what we meant to write and to get it right. And that's such a neat thing that when we figure out that we've done something that we shouldn't have done, uh, that we shouldn't have done, and, or that we found something that we knew we were supposed to do and we just didn't get it done, that, that we don't have to think about it as being written forever in pen, uh, but that we can think about it as something that that we can ask God forgiveness and that, that we can erase it and that God gives us a chance to, to start over. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you loved us so much that you made a way for us to be forgiven, for our mistakes to be erased and wiped clean for a fresh start. We pray, Lord, that you would forgive us for the things we've done and the things we've left undone, may all of that be erased and we start fresh today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. God of mercy and forgiveness. We come this morning as people prone to failure and mistakes. We let down ourselves and one another, but in the abundance of your grace, you give us another chance time after time. We pray that we would use these chances to love you and our neighbor more deeply. And we lift up our gratitude to you this morning. In your holy name we pray, amen.
So this is the seventh week uh, in the Reboot series, and uh, uh, in the staff and among us in the office, uh, this has been our focus. It, it is a very timely thing to talk and think about rebooting. Uh, we have been working towards uh, November 1st, next Sunday. Next Sunday is All Saints Sunday, which is already an important and a significant day uh, in the life of our church family. Every year on the first Sunday in November, uh, we remember those who have died in the last year. We celebrate Holy Communion. We will do that next Sunday in the 9 o'clock service where we will be live and in person and families will be coming back together uh, to remember and to celebrate. We will also remember and name the names of our saints uh, and include them uh, in what we stream next week at 11. And those of you who are still worshiping at home who aren't able uh, to be with us next Sunday, uh, we have juice already prepared, the elements, uh, both bread and juice for Holy Communion, uh, consecrated and ready, sealed, uh, and in individual Ziploc bags. And uh, if you will come by during the week this week, uh, when the office is open, then Charlotte has those for you. And if you can't get here to get it, call the office and let us know, uh, and we will do our best. We've had some volunteers who've offered uh, to make some deliveries, uh, because we we want those of you who are worshiping on the live stream uh, to be able uh, to be connected uh, and to participate in the practice, in the observance of the sacrament as well. A way in which on this special day, we can remain connected even though we are socially distanced. Even scattered, we can be connected. All Saints is always a special day. Uh, But this year, November 1st, takes on an even greater significance uh, in the life of our community because we'll be taking our next big steps uh, in the process of rebooting. COVID uh, shut us down March 13th, and uh, it wasn't until July 12th uh, that we had anybody in the building for worship. And, and now we're ready to take the next step. You see, since the 13th of March, um, we have not had a nursery. Our His Kids and preschool programs uh, have not been meeting, and our youth group has not been meeting. 33 weeks without these vital ministries uh, meeting together. But all of that's going to change next Sunday, and so we're excited about that. We've sent out instructions. Uh, Reese has sent out the way uh, to make reservation. There's information about the nursery and the preschool hall, about his kids, and and Mike has been pushing information uh, out about youth, and we've been working on safety protocols, and all of the plans are in place. Extra cleaning and, and sanitizing has been done so that we are ready to reboot next Sunday. I invite you to to join us in praying towards Sunday, that it would be a great day and that uh, uh, it would be a great next step in our rebooting. Back during the summer, as we were thinking and talking about uh, how to frame preaching for the fall, uh, as we talked and prayed, uh, the image that kept coming to my mind was from my childhood, uh, the image of the do-over. Growing up, uh, we spent most of our time uh, outside. We would come in from school, the carpool would drop us off, we would get our homework done as quick as we could, and and then we would be out the door, uh, and the last words were, be home for supper. Uh, And so uh, we would go uh, in the time before cell phones and video games and home computers, uh, we would take off with some kind of athletic equipment, whether it was football or basketball or baseball gloves and bats, and uh, Uh, And we would often migrate to the big flat yards uh, where we could have a great game of ball. And so whether it was the Wallers or the Hilburns, uh, we would gather. And most days there was a game in those front yards. Boys would come from throughout all of Northwoods uh, to play. And invariably it would happen that uh, at some point in the game there would be a close play. 
uh, a judgment call? Uh, was it a completion or uh, an incomplete pass? Or was he out or was he safe? And, and then voices would be raised. He's out. No, he was safe. He beat it. No, I, I got him with the tag. And, and, and both teams were so invested that, that they couldn't see the other perspective. And voices would be raised, but with no umpires or referees to help us, uh, we were at an impasse. And when nobody would give up, finally somebody would say, do over. And with those words, everything just reset. The runners would go back to where they were. The batter got back in the box and the, and the pitcher started the wind up. We, we found a way without instant replay or, or umpires. We found a way to, to get through it. And that was the do over. The do-over, it, it resolved many a conflict and helped us avoid fights because we had the chance just to do it over and move on. I don't know about you, but I wish life came with do-overs. Maybe, maybe you have no regrets. Maybe you've gotten everything in life right the first time, but, but I'll be the first to admit that but I, there have been times in my life when I has wished for and I have prayed for a do-over. Anybody else, uh, I hope uh, you understand, you know what that feeling is. Maybe you've wished for a do-over too. I, I know James and John uh, wanted a do-over. James and John were two of Jesus' disciples, the, the sons of Zebedee. These two brothers uh, were part of the inner circle uh, of Jesus' disciples. In Mark chapter 10, uh, beginning in verse 35, it tells us that these two brothers come to Jesus and say, Jesus, we want us to do for you whatever we ask of you. And he says, what do you want? And they say, we want to sit one on your right and one on your left in glory. And then Jesus gives them a lesson and what it means to be first in the kingdom. To be first, to be great in Jesus' kingdom is to be a servant. In fact, he says it is to be a slave to others. It's not about position. It's not about power. It's not about privilege. It's not about seats of honor. It's about sacrifice and service to others. They got it wrong. They got it bad wrong that day, and I know that they would love a do-over. They would love to not be known uh, as the sons of thunder who got it wrong. I'm sure they would have liked it just fine if the gospel writers had left this story out. But I, for one, am glad that this story is in our scripture. I'm sure they would have liked it to, to not have been shown at their worst. But you see, James and John uh, go on to be leaders in the early church. They lead the church. And according to tradition, James was beheaded and John was boiled in oil because they would, refu would not re recant their faith. They refused to renounce their faith. They lived and died their commitment to Christ. So yes, they got it that wrong that day on the road. They got it as wrong as could be, but, but they made good use of their do-over. They made the most of their reboot. Their failure did not take them out of the game. James and John are not the only disciples who would have liked to do-over. Think about Peter, Simon Peter. He, like James and John, had walked away from his fishing net to follow Jesus. Peter was the one who walked on the water with Jesus. He had been a witness to healings and miraculous feedings. Peter was on the mountain and witnessed the transfiguration. Peter heard the voice of God from heaven say, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Peter had been there. He had seen and he had heard. Yes, he had. He had, but still. Still, when confronted in the courtyard of the high priest, Peter denied that he even knew Jesus. And not just once, but three times. Three times Peter denied that he was one of Jesus' disciples. At the Last Supper, just hours before, Peter had promised to be faithful, even if it cost him his life. 
And here it is just a few hours later, and Peter has denied Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. Don't you know that Peter w- would have liked to do over, reboot the courtyard conversation for me, please? And Jesus, Jesus didn't roll back time. He didn't give him a chance to respond differently, uh, but he does give him an opportunity for a do-over. Peter doesn't get, he does get a do-over of sorts. Uh, in John chapter 21, the, the, the disciples have gone fishing. They've sort of given up on the ministry and they've gone fishing. And the resurrected Jesus appears on the beach and is cooking breakfast for them, calls them to come ashore, and and he asks Peter there on the beach, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus says, then feed my sheep. And then he asks him again, not just once, not twice, but three times he asks Peter, do you love me? And three times Peter professed his faith, his love in Christ. Peter's life as a disciple and, and his role as a leader in the church is rebooted on that beach. Peter becomes the rock, the, the leader of the church. He is faithful. He, he did not let his past define him. Think about the apostle Paul. He started out chasing Christians uh, even as far as Damascus. He went to take them back to Jerusalem in chains to face trial. He was part of that mob that killed Stephen in the name of tradition and orthodoxy. But even as an enemy of the church, even as a persecutor of Christ, he had the opportunity for a do-over, a chance to reboot And he becomes the greatest church planter and the most prolific writer in the New Testament. His failures, his mistakes didn't disqualify him. He he was not defined by his worst moments. He made a new start. He changed. In in the history of the church, St. Augustine of Hippo was a, a bishop and one of the great church fathers. His leadership and his writing uh, has had tremendous impact uh, on our church. But he was not always a saint. In fact, in his younger days, uh, he had indulged in great sin. Uh, His mother, Monica, uh, prayed for him regularly, and he said prayed him into conversion. Well, after he had been converted, he he saw uh, the woman with whom he had lived outside of marriage, and she came and approached him, and he ran away. He literally went the other way, and she called after Augustine and said, Augustine, it's I. But he turned around and said, but it's not I. The old Augustine is dead, and I am a new creature in Christ. He didn't let his failure disqualify him. God's grace had given him a new start, a reboot. He was a new creature in Christ, a new creation, but he wanted to protect that. He wanted to make the most of that opportunity. Some of our children and the Methodist home may, may can identify with the story uh, of Andrew Bridge. Andrew spent 11 years in the foster care system. For a time, he lived in McLaurin's children's home uh, in Los Angeles, a facility that has been criticized for its harsh treatment of children and, and was ultimately closed by the courts. As a child, Andrew had to deal with the aftermath of his mother's suicide attempt. And as a toddler, he had witnessed her beating and assault. And he had been forced to to rifle through dumpsters to look for food when their money ran out. To consider all of the things uh, that he had to go through uh, is harrowing. The odds were very much against Andrew. The likelihood of failure was very high. But he managed to graduate from high school, which, which the statistics are, are very low. And so that was a major accomplishment. But not only did he graduate from high school, but he went to college. And not only did he graduate from college, but he went to law school. And not just any law school, he went to Harvard. And then as a young adult, even cancer Even cancer as a young adult could not prevent Andrew Bridge from becoming everything God had created him to be. 
Andrew Bridge is a best-selling author, a lawyer, and a fierce advocate for children. His book, Hope's Boy, tells his story. Andrew Bridge was, was more, is more than his history. He's more than what happened to him, and he refused to let his past limit his possibilities, and he is making a difference in the lives of others. How we handle failure is so important. It's huge. How we deal with our mistakes and failures determines uh, our future in so many ways. Think about people in our world that we encounter their work and, and their stories. Steven Spielberg, the great movie maker, he applied to film school at USC twice, and twice they rejected him. But that didn't stop him from making movies. He didn't let their rejection define him. He grossed over $8.5 billion from the films that he directed. Charles Schultz that, that drew the Peanuts characters... When he was in high school, he submitted his drawings to his high school yearbook, and they were rejected. His cartoons and, and the products connected to them uh, are a billion dollars a year business. That's probably why his high school eventually put a statue of Snoopy uh, in the lobby in the office. The writer Jack Canfield uh, of Chicken Soup fame you know that he was rejected 144 times before he found a publisher for the first chicken soup for the soul. He, he told the publisher, now this is the 145th publisher that he had talked to. He told him, I want to sell 1.5 million books in 18 months. And the publisher said, you'll be lucky to sell 20,000 books ever. His first book sold 18 million copies around the world. Inventor James Dyson wanted to create a, a vacuum cleaner that didn't have a bag in it. Everybody told him, well, first of all, nobody cared. Nobody was working on that at all. Uh, and he started working on it. He failed. He had 5,125 designs that did not work. But number 5,126 did. But even then, he had obstacles to overcome because none of the manufacturers would build his vacuum. He had to build it himself. Well, last year, Dyson made over a billion dollars profit in the U.S. alone. How we deal with failure makes all the difference. You know, Sunday mornings in Las Vegas, the streets are pretty empty. Most of Vegas sleeps in on Sunday. But four miles south of the Strip, two parking lots fill up every Sunday. A pastor marches purposely uh, towards a lectern. He's always been busy on Sunday. Even before he was a pastor, Sunday was his biggest work day. But because he, before he was a pastor, he was an NFL quarterback. His name is Randall Cunningham. Now, life moved fast for Randall. He came from a working class family in Santa Barbara, went to UNLV, and then to Philadelphia. He, he stepped into an NFL world that he described as uh, fast-paced. He said, you can date who you want to date, you can spend what you want to spend, you can live where you want to live, you can drive what you want to drive. And, and Randall did date, and he did spend, and he, he signed, before, right after he signed his rookie contract, before he had ever thrown an NFL pass, he drove up to training camp in a Porsche 944. And as he did better on the field, life outside of football moved faster. In fact, uh, the, the hype train for Randall Cunningham was accelerating. And Randall said, without hesitation, I jumped on. And I wasn't just along for the ride. I was the conductor. He said, I bathed in the attention. I gravitated toward the glamour. He would write, I admit that when I first entered the league, I didn't fully understand the enormity of the situation. It's easy to stay self-focused, doing the things that make you feel good or make money for you or make you more popular. And Randall said, I was more about me than anyone else. Now, he grew up in the church, but, but he didn't have a relationship with God at that point in his life. He called himself a Christian, but, but he said, I didn't walk as one. 
And then one day he was playing golf in Vegas, and a friend said he needed to get serious about his faith. He needed to commit to Christ and to the Christian faith, and, and he did. Now, after some injuries, you may remember, he, he went through a short retirement, and then he ran a tile business in Vegas, but eventually he came back to the field, and everybody said when he came back, Randall Cunningham was different. He not only participated in the NFL Bible studies, he arrived early to set up the chairs. He, he started learning Greek and Hebrew and memorizing scripture and praying. And when he retired, he, he started a ministry center focused on athletics and, and fine arts. And that ministry center grew into a church. Now, Randall Cunningham could have said, God can't use me. I'm just a washed up football player. Or he could have said, I'm disqualified because of the things that I've done. He could have taken his money and just checked out. Taken his family and, and left everybody else to fend for themselves. But, but God's grace opened doors for him. God said, you, you are not defined by what you used to do or, or what, what you used to be. Your mistakes are not more powerful than my grace. And God is using Randall Cunningham for the kingdom. His rebooted life is making a difference. The problem is, too many of us can't shake off the past. Too many people think that, they, that what they used to do or used to be or used to believe or used to say that that disqualifies them forever. I talk to a lot of people a lot of people who are carrying heavy loads of guilt and, and shame. Shame is, is one of the most corrosive of human emotions. Shame has the power to convince us that that little voice in our head is right. You know the voice, the one that says, I knew you'd fail. Or, or, or you'll never really belong. Or, or who could love somebody like you? It's both an excruciating feeling and a universal one. It happens to almost everybody, rich or poor, successful or struggling. We, we all experience shame from time to time, whether we admit it or not, and usually we don't. And that's part of where it gets its power. But shame... Shame, it can shut us down or it can emerge in patterns of destruction. It can help it cause us to do harm to ourselves and others. Shame has been linked to addiction and violence, aggression, depression, eating disorders and bullying. So it's critical, it's critical that we deal with guilt and shame. You know, the love and grace of God allows us to be free of guilt and shame. Jesus, Jesus on the beach that day with Peter, he, he didn't shame him. He, he restored him. He, he didn't say, I told you so. He commissioned him for leadership in the church. When they brought the woman caught in adultery before Jesus, he, he didn't shame her either. He, he didn't condemn her. And he told her to go and sin no more. He opened the door for a new future. When he sat down by the well and the Samaritan woman who had had five husbands came uh, and they began to talk, Jesus didn't take her on a guilt trip. Uh, he, he didn't load her down uh, with shame to go with the baggage she was already carrying. He was gracious. He was forgiving. And that hasn't changed. That is still who God is today. The story of the scriptures is the story of God using the unexpected. It's the story of using the ones who had failed the ones who thought themselves disqualified. Think about just a few from the scriptures. Noah, he was a drunk. Abraham thought he was too old. Jacob was a liar. Joseph was abused and abandoned by his family. Moses, who led the people to freedom, he was a murderer and a fugitive from justice. Samson was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah was too young. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Elijah was suicidal. Jonah ran from God, went the exact opposite direction of the way God wanted him to go. 
Job filed for bankruptcy. Peter denied Christ not once, not twice, but three times. Mary Magdalene was demon-possessed. Timothy had an ulcer. Paul was a Christian killer. And, and remember Lazarus? God used him. Well, well he was dead. God used all of these. The story of the scripture is God using the unexpected. God opening the door for everybody. If God can use these, then guess what? God can use us. God can use us here at Vineville not only to come and attend, but as leaders to be in ministry, even, even ordained ministry. In a week, we will gather for charge conference, and at that event, we will recommend a candidate for ordained ministry. Who knows who else God may be calling from this place to serve. God's grace might be very well in the process of rebooting a life for ordained and representative ministry. It happens. Trust me, it happens. Earlier, Mike and Lindsay sang... A thousand times I've failed, still your mercy remains. Our closing hymn today has the line in it, Fears and doubts too long have bound us. You know, it's my prayer. It's my hope and prayer that all of us can hear these words as an invitation. We don't have to be defined by our failures or our mistakes. God wants us to be free of guilt and shame. Imagine the Lord saying to you, I love you. You're forgiven. It's a do-over. Reboot and move into the future that is not limited by your failure. I don't know, maybe, maybe like that song said, you've gotten lost in your mistakes. The invitation is is to lay your burdens down, to take your place in the Father's house. You know, if, if, grace, if grace can come to Randall Cunningham on a golf course in Las Vegas, then whether you're here at church or whether you're sitting in your living room at home or even whether you're listening as you're driving down the road, there is absolutely no place where God's love and grace can't reach. May the grace of God set us free from what went before and reboot us for what God has in the future. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
That is our prayer. Fear and doubts too long have bound us. Free our hearts for work and praise. May the grace and love of God free you and all of us for work and praise in God's kingdom. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.